for this invitation, this opportunity to give this series of, uh, of lectures. So I will, I will present uh, this series of work uh, that uh, we did with uh, Frank, Jeremy Jeftel, and Igor Ronjanski. And before doing that, I'd like to say that uh, um, you know, the, the aim of this series of lectures is really to, uh, 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 to take the time to present the problem, present the state of the art, present the results, which is what I'm going to do to, to, today. And then, of course, get really into the proof, sort of see the key uh, uh, feature of the proof. And I think that one thing I'd like to do is try to answer uh, the question that Laure asked me when I presented this work for the, start, for the first time, why do you do this and why do you do that, right? Why, why, where do the, all these renormalizations come from? What's the intuition and, you know, how do you put what has been done into a much global picture, which sort of makes all this thing completely in some sense, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's about trying to make a picture emerge, okay? So really today I'm, I'm really going to start from scratch really do, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the global theory. Maybe next time I will be more specific about the state of the art on this kind of problem. And really the last two lectures will be 100% devoted to uh, the, the, the description of uh, uh, singularity formation for, uh, for the defocusing in there. So let me just start today with the problem that I'm going to study because it's going to be the main model for the day, okay? The nonlinear Schrödinger equation. And just present the model, what is known, and why it's a relevant problem, and uh, uh, why, uh, what do we want to do uh, 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 with this thing, okay? So this is the model I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to study all along the, the, the lecture. So I have my complex equation. So I put a parameter epsilon. I take a power nonlinearity. This is equal to zero. So t is time, so u is a function of t and x, its complex value, t is time, uh, x is in Rd, and epsilon is, uh, maybe this should be epsilon, epsilon belongs to minus 1,1, one, one. Uh, and p is, is typically an integer, may, maybe not, p is bigger than 1, and I want to, to, uh, to study this, and of course there are two problems. If epsilon is plus one, this is the focusing problem. This is focusing in S. And if epsilon is minus one, this is defocusing in S. Okay, and of course what, what we want to do, we want to describe solution to, to this thing. We want to understand what uh, 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 solutions do. And I shall say that uh, I'm not going, not going to say this immediately, but what will be uh, a, a key step uh, uh, in, the, in this lecture is to make a connection, which is actually uh, very well known in all connections, but I'll be more explicit, connection with compressible fluid mechanics, which is what I'm going to discuss later. But clearly, compressible fluid will be part uh, of the question that we, we would raise. Okay, so there are two things, uh, 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 two fundamental facts you need to know about this equation. So scaling uh, and conservation laws. Okay, so of course I should insist on uh, uh, everything I'm going to talk about. I always talk about uh, uh, the whole space. I'm never in a domain. And of course, it's understood that my boundary conditions, I want my U to be well localized at infinity, right? So everything is going to zero uh, at, 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 at infinity. So scaling and conservation laws. So there are two fundamental facts. One, so, so scaling is the following thing. If U of T and X is a solution to my equation, then there is a scaling group that acts on the set of solutions. So I prefer to think of it, or I can do it like this. So it's lambda to the two over P minus one, U of lambda squared T lambda X, which I call u lambda of t and x, where lambda is positive. This is also a solution uh, to the equation. This is because I, I am on the whole space. And let me stress the fact that, of course, uh, this exponent uh, is a linear. This is a linear number. This is simply because I have two derivatives in space and one derivative in time. But this number here 
is a nonlinear number, right? It's driven by uh, my nonlinearity. So when you have the scaling, people like to compute the so-called scaling exponent. Scaling exponent, so it's nothing, it's a number. And the rule of thumb to compute the number is simply you say the following words, you ask yourself which number of derivative measure, measured uh, in space, say, so say in L2, so I want this in L2. How many derivatives in L2 do not see scaling? So I want this to be equal to nabla s u lambda squared t dot, and of course uh, L2 is taken in x. Okay, and then the answer to this question, it computes, so it gives you a number. So it gives you s, which is the so-called scaling, which uh, is probably something like d over 2 minus 2 over p minus 1, I think, something like this. Uh, and of course, this, this tells you, so this defines, this is what people like to call the critical norm. So it's the so it's the homogeneous it's the homogeneous homogeneous Sobolev norm that does not see scaling. Okay, so always think of it this way. I like to think of it this way. It's both uh, a very strong norm because you can change the size of the solution and this norm is still under control and a completely pathetic norm because you can, change, you can change the size of the solution and it doesn't see it, okay? So it's both very strong and very weak. Depends what you want to do. Okay, so this is the first thing. And then the second fundamental, the second, if you want, fact that you need to know about this equation, of course, is uh, uh, um, conservation laws. So there is some structure in the back, uh, which is related to the fact that I've taken a specific non-linearity. So here, the sign of epsilon will be fundamental. So I have two conservation, I have two conserved quantities. So the L2 norm of the solution is an invariant in time. So this is the integral of U. This is conservation of mass. And I have the energy or the Hamiltonian of my equation. So the energy the energy, which is half the integral of Rd of the kinetic energy. So I have minus, uh, did I put here, minus epsilon divided by p plus 1 integral over Rd of modulus of u and x t to the p plus 1 dx. This is equal to the energy of data, which I will call Rd. Okay, so these are two. Of course, you need to know that your Cauchy problem makes sense in this norm, but essentially nice initial data will give a unique strong solution and you have uh, these two quantities. So with this in hand, uh, you can, of course, you can compare uh, scaling and conservation laws. And roughly, uh, of, of course, this has to do with the fact that, of course, these are special cases of Sobolev norm. This is the case s equals 0. This is the case s equals 1. So if you could s the critical ex exponent, you have a d d different rules. So if s is negative, that is, if p is not too large, this is, uh, this is the mass subcritical world. This is mass subcritical. If sc is between 0 and 1, so maybe I'm going to call it s. This is the uh, mass supercritical energy subcritical world. If SC equal one, if S equal one, this is the energy critical problem. And if S is bigger than one, this is the energy supercritical problem. Okay, and most of these lectures, actually starting next time, are going to be about this case. Okay, this is, this is what I want to focus on and, and explain 
what is going on here. But, but whatever has been done here is clearly, I mean, uh, 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 the, the global picture is essential to, to, to understand what, what's going on here. And let me say that all these cases uh, uh, are certainly of interest. They correspond to uh, various physical c situation and they correspond also to uh, rather different mathematical situations. I will try to explain that. OK, so I have conservation law, I have scaling. And of course, uh, uh, maybe this is true. Uh, let me recall you uh, the Gini Brenvelo uh, 83, uh, which is an absolutely, uh, which was a complete breakthrough back in the time. And what, what they tell you essentially is that if you are energy subcritical, uh, then if you give me an initial data in H1, of Rd, so if I am below energy, then there exists a unique uh, strong solution which lives on some ma maximal uh, time interval 0t with value in H1, and, and, and that's the key, there is the blow up criterion that t is finite, implies that the H1 norm. of the solution must explode. OK, so you have subcritical uh, 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 local existence and a blow-up criterion, which tells you that if you want to continue your, your solution forever, all you need to do is control uh, the H1 norm. Of course, this is absolutely not a, tr a triviality. Huh? The, 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 uh, at least, uh, maybe it's in dimension one, it's, uh, it's obvious. But the proof really relies on Strickard's estimate. This is beautiful, uh, which are the key, uh, which if you want, you need a smoothing effect to understand that, that at the end of the day, of course, you cannot just control the H1 norm. You need to control more. This is three cards. But at the end of the day, all you need to do, you have this blow-up criterion. You blow up if and only if the H1 norm blows up. Okay? And this has nothing to do uh, with the sign of epsilon. Uh, here, epsilon is uh, plus 1 or minus 1. It's irrelevant. Okay, So there are two uh, obvious co corollaries of that, corollary 1. So, uh, this is, uh, so this is the defocusing case. If epsilon is minus 1, so if I am energy subcritical, then the lifetime is plus infinity. Okay? And I always, always con con consider H1 data. So you have global existence below uh, when you are energy sub subcritical. Okay? And the, the proof is on the ball. Why? Simply because the proof is simply that the L2 norm is equal to L2 norm of data. It's conserved. And and the energy is conserved. And the energy is, is, is conserved. The energy of data, so E0, it's equal to the energy of the full solution. Uh, minus epsilon of p plus 1 u to the p plus 1. And of course, this is plus 1. OK, so in particular, I control this, which means that the L2 norm of the gradient of the solution is controlled by the L2 norm of data, in particular, the energy. OK, so your H1 norm is under control. So Gini Brandvelo tells you that you have global existence. And so in fact, so you have to be you need to work more. And of course, you need not to put yourself in stupid cases. But the philosophy behind this thing is also a mark. In fact, not only do you have global existence, but you have scattering. So you have to be, you have to be quite careful with your experiments. Not always true, but essentially, which means that you are attracted. The attractor is the linear flow. The attractor is the linear flow. So if you want, you have a complete understanding of your dynamical system, essentially. You start from any data asymptotically. You are global in time, and you are asymptotically attracted by a solution to the linear flow. This is end of story in terms of description of the, of the solutions. Uh, so how do I get this thing back? That, that's this? 
Will you ask, uh, are you consider the case where uh, you are in the whole space? <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, say that again? You, you consider only the case of the whole space? Of the, of the whole space, yeah. yeah. So, so look, maybe I can just say some, 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 something here. Uh, global existence questions certainly depend a lot on whether you own the whole space or the torus, etc. Now, if I show you singularity formation, everything I'm going to show you is about singularities that are typically local in space. Okay, so if I give you a singularity in RD and you ask me to put it on the, on the torus, it's, usually it's, it's a triviality. There's nothing to do because it's completely local in space. Okay, so as far as singularities, so you have to be careful. Sometimes boundary matters. There are singularities that are created only by boundaries. So that's, that's a different world. But in some sense, if, if you give me a domain and you want a singularity in the middle, inside, then essentially if you know one on RD, because you have concentration, etc., it, it doesn't matter. And of course, if you talk about global existence, it's a completely different world. And there are singularities created by boundaries, which is yet something else. But I'm just going to talk about RD. Okay, so this is, of course, this is global existence in the defocusing case. And the second co corollary, so, uh, uh, so this was corollary maybe one. Let me give corollary two. Corollary two. So if epsilon is plus one, so I am in the focusing case, and S is negative, then again, is plus infinity. Okay, and the proof is again the same. The only difference, the only difference is all you need to say is that the energy which is conserved is half gradient squared. But now you have a minus sign. And you have a RD. But now, all you know, so of course, you have a minus side, so a priori, you don't control this, uh, this quantity. However, you do your sub -LF, and you do your homogeneous interpolation, and you will discover that for any function u, you can control this by u in L2 to some power, which I don't care for, times the gradient of u in L2 to another power. I don't know, I'm going to call it know, alpha of p of d. And the point is that alpha is less than 2 if and only if s is negative. This is just a well, if you do, you do your algebra. And of course, if I, when I apply this to the solution to NLS, this is conserved. OK, so this grows like the gradient square. This is strictly less than square. And this is constant. So there is no way this guy can become large and dominate. OK, so I get myself a bound immediately. So it means that I bound it again. I have an a priori bound on the H1 norm of the solution. So which means that I have an a priori bound on the norm of the solution in H1. It bounded essentially by data. So I have global existence. Okay, and of course, remark, you have to be careful, of course, uh, there is no scattering there. There is, a, uh, there is global existence, but there is no scattering, in particular, because there are new kind of solutions, there are new nonlinear solutions. Actually, there are tons of them. But one way to make uh, uh, a non-dispersive solution is, to, is simply to look for a so-called soliton. So I look for time periodic solution, Q of x to the IT. And I get myself a PDE, which is Laplace Q minus Q to Q to the P minus 1 equals 0. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the range, so if S is negative, then there are, well, actually, what I really need is S less than 1. Uh, there are uh, many solutions, like Q of X, which I need. Okay, there are tons of ways to construct them, and typically soliton. So they, are, they typically look, if you look with, typically with spherical symmetry, you have to think that these are bubbles of energy, which are typically very well localized, right? And in the subcritical case here, I would have exponential decay. Okay, so I have well localized bubbles of energy that stay in my system for, forever. These are my solitons. 
Okay, so this is the second thing. Uh, so, so, so first corollary of Ginny Brand Velo, global existence in the defocusing case, and global existence if I am mass subcritical case in the focusing case. And third corollary, so actually, uh, this is not exactly a, a corollary, but it, it's in the same convex envelope, corollary three. So I'm still in the focusing case, and I assume that S is positive. Then, then there exists data in H1 such that the lifetime is finite. Okay, so this is a completely spectacular fact. So I, I, I want to stress this. This is, this is absolutely spectacular. There are essentially no problems on which we can show something like that. We have a criterion for global existence, which is completely sharp. If you're below the mass critical, you have global existence. As soon as you're above, you can form singularities. Not all solutions do form singularities, but some will. And this is completely uh, uh, spectacular. If it's completely spectacular, uh, it's usually because it's completely trivial. So it's, uh, it has nothing to do with analysis. It has to do with algebra, which, of course, is it's always a triviality. So proof. The proof is simply that uh, um, you compute the variance of the solution. So actually, I should give myself, yeah, well, maybe I can do this here. So you compute the variance of the solution, dx. So, so this, is, this is this quantity. And what you will see is that it's equal to, I'm going to write it here, it's equal to 16 times the energy of a data plus, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to write this over there. Okay, so my virial identity says that d squared dt squared ah, d squared dt squared of the integral of r squared u squared of t and x dx is equal to 16 times the energy of the data, which is conserved, minus a constant which depends on d and p times the integral of rt of the modulus of u to the p plus 1 dx, and s positive if and only if this constant is positive. OK, so what it tells you immediately is that if you are in this space initially, that you can show that you're strong that your unique strong H1 solution will stay there. And it tells you immediately that if you start it with strictly negative energy, if you start it with strictly negative energy, then uh, what you have is d squared dt squared of x squared u squared dx is less than 16 times the energy which means the following thing, if this is time, and if you draw this quantity, then at time zero I am something, and what I know is that I am below, I don't know what it's equal to, it can be whatever it wants, but it needs to be below some inverted parabola because this is strictly negative. Okay, so this positive quantity, it needs to be below this, and this touches zero at some point. So somewhere in between here and here, my positive quantity much, must become zero or even be, become negative, which is immediately a contradiction to Cauchy theory, in particular the uh, conservation of mass. So it simply means that somewhere in between zero and this stupid time here, something must have happened. Okay? So this is not something that tells you what happens. This is something that tells you that the solution cannot live forever. This means that the solution cannot leave forever. OK, and this is the end of my proof. OK, so let me make uh, maybe uh, three comments here, so, or, or two, so comments.
So maybe a first fact, fa uh, uh, comment one, is the following thing. This is a completely ridiculous proof. All I'm doing is I'm staring at some quantity and I exhibit some convexity. This is, this is a proof about convexity. Some positive quantity uh, must become negative. So something wrong must have happened along the way. And of course, this is very much related to this equation and only this equation. So you can ask me, how general is this? And the answer is, well, of course, it's very specific. But in fact, you can do exactly the same thing with the wave equation. You can do the same thing with, hey, with the heat equation. You have many problems for which this kind of thing can be done. And well, this kind of convexity argument has proved to be extremely useful. And in fact, in his PhD uh, uh, back in 83, Sideris uh, exhibited exactly the same argument for compressible free. 3D compressible fluids, uh, which was very remarkable. So I don't write what the PDE is. I'm going to do this in detail la later. But but this is so. Th so this is telling you that this kind of structure and this kind of argument by convexity uh, um, uh, exist elsewhere. And for a long time, it's been uh, the only actually kind of uh, it was the only way to prove that singularity is. Okay, but then second comment. Uh, you have to be careful. There is very little information on the nature of the singularity. But you don't know. Uh, in particular, it's even more dramatic than that. Uh, we could show when there are large classes of data for which you can show that singularity will never happen here. This time is irrelevant. Singularity happens before. Okay, so the vanishing of the variable has nothing to do by no mean with what happened at the time of, of singularity. Huh? So, so, so typically, it's not always the case, but generically blow up happens before T star. Okay, however, I must say, there's something actually quite surprising. However, uh, there is more than this is not, there is something that's not completely ridiculous and which is actually not so well uh, un understood. Uh, there is a sharp, a sharp uh, universal upper bound. on the blow-up speed. Uh, uh, for radial data. Uh, which is hidden here. Hidden. for radial data, which is hidden uh, in the variable identity. So what I mean is that if you work more, um, you can work with it. So what do I mean by that? So what do I mean by, by, by the blow-up speed? So remember, I know that singularity formation must correspond to the H1 norm blowing up, but the L2 norm is conserved. So what I call blow-up speed is simply, if I blow up, I want to essentially control this quantity. So this is what I call the blow-up speed. Okay, how fast, if I blow up in finite time, I know that this part explodes, how fast does it explode? And what I'm, what I'm saying here is that what we can show abstractly is that uh, the L2 norm of the gradient, so if I blow up at, so big T will always be my blow-up time. If I blow up at some time T, what we can show is that there is a bound which certainly depends on data. So this is an asymptotic bound close enough to the singularity. And I have a power, so typically uh, I have a power alpha. And the, the, so the bound that we get is an alpha which depends on P and Z. So it's true for any radial data. So you need a range, so this is typically for S between 0 and 1. And not only 
there is an alpha, but alpha is attained. So there is an alpha, and alpha is attained. So, you know, I used to say that, that this was completely useless. Well, you have to be a little bit more careful. There is some information there. So it's not exactly this, but you know, if you work things out, actually there's more than you could think uh, in this kind of identities. And this has probably uh, consequences elsewhere as, as, as well. Okay, so it's already a first information on how singularity is formed. Okay, so... Right, so what's the, so if, 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 if I summarize the situation so, so, so far, what we have is, is the following. So in the defocusing case, so when epsilon is minus one, so if I draw the Sobolev scale of S, so I have one, so I excluded it. So here I have global existence and essentially scattering unless you go too far below. And for epsilon equal plus one in the focusing case, and if this is my Sobolev scale, so this would be zero. I mean, uh, maybe I can put zero here. So I would have zero here. So here, this is the world of global existence. And here, this is the world where there exist singularities. But of course, not everybody blows up. It's very easy to, to, to have global solutions, to have scattering solutions. You, you, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so, uh, but singularities exist in this range, and actually, uh, they exist in the all range here. They exist for all s. Okay, so really the 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 uh, the question is. So there are two questions. So there are really two questions that. Uh, these are the two questions that I will discuss uh, uh, during this lecture. So question one. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, that there exist blow-up solution in particular in the regime S bigger than 1 uh, and uh, epsilon is minus 1. Okay, so in the in the in the defocusing case, so in the case that is here, do I have singularity for formation there? Of course, I should say that my virial argument uh, uh, is not going to work huh, because you never have the energy is always positive, so you can never be in the world where the energy is strictly negative in the in the in the in the in the defocusing case. And the second question, uh, which is more 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 general, is what do blow up solutions look like. Okay, and this is probably may, maybe the central uh, 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 question in, the, in this lecture. I have nothing to say, or so little that it's pathetic on general you know, classification of singularity formation for NLS. But, uh, but I do have to say, and uh, this is certainly not just me, there's been an enormous activity uh, in the last 40 years with an acceleration in the last 20 years on these questions, and it's all related to the question of scenario. What kind of scenario do we have on singularity formations? What kind of examples do we have? Do we have all the examples? Certainly not. But we, we certainly have understood uh, uh, quite a few of these scenarios. And the, my point is the following. Um, what will happen in this series of lectures, so I will recall you uh, 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 the starting point of the intuition. In some sense, the problem that is best understood is the focusing problem. I will recall you what we know in this case and how, in particular, I will recall you the kind of scenario that we know there. I will explain why none of this scenario has a chance to work in the defocusing case. They are all doomed, except that they will give us, uh, they will feed our intuition for the defocusing case. And this is where the connection will be made with compressible fluid.
Okay, this is, this is what I want to do. So I, I really want to take the time, maybe next time, or maybe I'll start today, but we'll see. But I, I, you know, to, to, to really make it crystal clear what we know in sort of somehow the, the simpler case, the focusing case, and explain how it gives you a hint on, or, you know, an angle of attack to actually understand something uh, uh, in the defocusing case and why it's connected to a compressible fluids. Okay, so let me start with uh, this question here. So let, let me go back. So let me go back. So maybe this was, I don't know, two. Okay, so let me talk specifically now about the defocusing problem. Defocusing problem uh, in the energy in the energy critical and supercritical range. So I want S bigger than one. Okay, so epsilon is minus one. S is bigger than, than one. What can we say there? And do we have uh, global air resistance or, or not. So, of, of course, there is an absolutely spectacular uh, series of works. So, this was initiated by Bourguin, then by uh, the I team, Coliander, Stafilani, Takaoka, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and Tao, and then revisited later by uh, 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 Kenning of Mer. So, this is the so called energy critical problem. Energy critical problem. In this case, so it's critical because, of course, what can happen see, you need to understand what the enemy is. So, what happens there is that, uh, so in the energy critical case, you have to be careful. So, the blow up criterion, the blow up criterion which was the subcritical blow-up criterion saying that T finite implies that the L2 norm of the gradient blows up, explodes, if you want, I should say maybe implies that the limit when T goes to T of the L2 norm of the gradient is plus infinity. This thing is now false, is now false. Okay, and this is precisely because you are at the energy critical level. What could happen? The, the enemy is uh, 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 the concentration of the of the concentration of the critical mass. Huh? Another way of saying this is that the lifetime of the solution really is not a function or cannot be lower bounded by a function of the norm itself. It really depends on the profile of the solution itself. So the typical enemy is, this is what you need to rule out, the enemy, the typical enemy is a solution that would want to look li like this. It would want to typically concentrate. So you see you put a scaling parameter here. Maybe you have some profile P of x of a lambda of t where p is some fixed function, and lambda of t is something that goes to zero. Right? Because if you compute, uh, if you pretend that this is the leading of, of the size of the solution, what you will see is that the L2 norm of the gradient, precisely because this is the L2 critical case, the L2 norm of the gradient will not see uh, the L2 norm of the gradient. If, if I assume that this is exactly this, it would exactly be the L2 norm of the gradient of P. So it's going to be constant for all time, so there is no contradiction with, um, with uh, the conservation of energy. And there is no, you know, Cauchy theory precisely tell me that controlling this norm is not good enough. I mean, I, I need really, it's, it's what, I, what I need to control is more subtle, so there is a priori uh, 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 no reason why this could not happen. Let me also say, and this is something very important to remember, Let me also say that if I am, because you could tell me, but this is a ridiculous scenario. So you have to be very careful. 
Hein? So careful. If epsilon uh, is 1, so if I am in the, in the focusing case, then this, I don't know, then star happens. OK, so you have to be careful. It's not because, you know, star happens, it means what? You have to understand what uh, it means. You, you see, in the focusing case, look at the conservation of energy. So this is the focusing case. I have a minus sign. OK, so this is Rd, this is dx. OK, so this thing does not depend on time. So there are two kinds of same things that could happen to you. Maybe the singularity can form because this quantity wants to become wild, and this one will also become wild, but they will, com they will compensate each, each other. This is scenario one. Another possible scenario is that, no, no, both these quantities, they remain of size one in the critical case, but as a matter of fact, the norm concentrates. Okay? And this is, you, you, you form a direct mass at the level of the mod modulus of gradient squared, right? This is your enemy. And as a matter of fact, uh, in the focusing case, this will happen. Okay? So you cannot just consider your PDE and say, for obvious reason, this is a ridiculous scenario. No, no, no. It does happen when you are in the focusing case. Okay? So this is very much po possible. So Bourguin, in the radial case, was the first one to show that this cannot happen. And maybe I'd just like to make a, a, a remark. So I, if I want to rethink uh, uh, Bourguin's result in terms of the killing mare root map, I'd just like to remind you, because this is some, something fundamental that, 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 that will feed uh, 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 the, the intuition later. So what we learn from, from the Kenning map root map, so we are, we are around 205, uh, what they tell you is that uh, what you know on this, on this problem, so I'm back with my defocusing problem and S is equal to 1. So what you know is that if, if data is small, if data is small uh, in the sense of the critical norm, uh, or if you want, if the energy is small, then you have global existence and scattering. So what they say is, well, I raise the level of energy, and then what I need to show is that if there is a level, so it's an argument by contradiction, if there is a level of energy such that a singularity forms, okay, then in fact, there must be a minimal level of energy. There is a first, there is a critical level of energy which corresponds to the smallest possible singularity. And in fact, this level of energy comes with a special, uh, I can be associated a special initial data which, for which the flow is compact. Flow is compact in the energy space, so typically in, in, in H100. Uh, why is it the case? It's very clear. You see, if this is the smallest level uh, of, of singularity, if I take you know, a data that, 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 that lives there and would not want to, to scatter has to be very special because if I perturb it just a little bit, it will scatter because that's the definition of the minimal level of energy. So it's, it's a solution of the flow that wants to keep its shape. You know, it cannot eject energy at all. It has to keep its shape all the time. And typically, the heart of the proof of the kenig root map is to tell you, so if there is a singularity, there is a minimal singularity, then there is then there are special solutions which flow are compact in H1. So typical candidates are solitons, or typical candidates are exactly things like this, star. And now what, what they tell you is that because the problem, so in some sense this is very general, but what they tell you is that because the problem is defocusing, Because the problem is defocusing, this is where the structure is used in a very strong way. Because the problem is defocusing, there is no, there is no such minimal element. And in particular, one thing they use is that in particular, there are no solitons. 
I, I should may, may, maybe say this, you know, if I look at the, if, 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 if I look for uh, time, so there is something that one should know here, and it's actually quite annoying. I told you that the soliton corresponds to, so, to, to doing this ansatz, so a time periodic solution. So this leads to Laplace Q minus Q plus Q, Q to the P minus one is equal to zero, and I want Q in H1. But of course, if you know your talent to balance solitons, you know that this will not, uh, if you are in the energy critical case, so this is going to work only when S is less than one. Uh, when S is bigger than one, a non for a soliton should be Q of X. It's a stationary sol solution. So it leads to Laplace Q plus Q, Q to the P minus one is equal to zero, Q in H1. And now it's very easy to see that now if I put an epsilon here, so in the focusing case, I do have such solution. It's uh, I'm actually, you just look at the Rayleigh ideally symmetric case if you want and you solve your ADE. And, but of course, if epsilon is minus one, if epsilon is minus one, there are no such solution because you integrate by parts. Okay, so you should think that the way I like to think of this proof is really the, 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 the following. The proof goes as follows. In the energy critical case, if there was a singularity, there would be a first singularity, which would correspond to a very special solution to the problem, typically something that looks like a soliton. But because your problem is defocusing, there is no such guy. It's impossible. Okay? So it means that there cannot be a first singularity. So in fact, you have global existence and, and scattering, which is part of the part of the problem. Okay, so you would, so this is really the picture. Uh, so, so for S, so epsilon is minus one, S equal one, you have global existence and scattering. And really, I like to think of it this way. The proof is no uh, blow up scenario. for the minimal singularity. Okay, and, and, and I should say that, of course, the, the fact that the problem is critical, that S is one, and that uh, 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 the conservation law leaves, that this is the scaling of the conservation law, uh, this plays an absolutely essential role in the proof. I mean, this is, this is used all the time. I mean, this is absolutely central. The fact that the scaling is there and that the conservation law lives exactly at the level of the scaling, it's used absolutely everywhere uh, uh, in, in the proof. Okay, so the, the, the question, so problem, uh, so actually this is, in general, it's an open problem. I will give one very, very small and partial answer. Uh, 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 to this question, so open problem. So, so typically, so if I want s to be bigger than one, I need d to be bigger than three because otherwise my problem da, da, does not make sense. So, I am in dimension bigger than three. I ask for the nonlinearity to be large, large enough. I give myself a data in H one, or maybe actually I like to think that you know give yourself a data which is, you know, I like to think of C infinity da da data, and I want to make it well localized, super well localized. Okay, then can I show, can I show singular, can, can I show global existence, or can I show that there exists uh, da data for which I have singularity formation? Okay, and so in, in the defocusing energy supercritical case. Okay, so in, you know, we are very far from understanding uh, this thing in full generality, but you have to understand that, of course, the question is what is the role, uh, what is the role of the nonlinearity? So before maybe. Uh, uh, and so what is the role of the nonlinearity? So this is the, the first thing. And, and then, and, and of course, the second question, what is special with the critical case? Of course, there is something very special. As, as soon as S is bigger than one, so this is the supercritical world, uh, 
you have to think that uh, uh, your conservation nodes become weak. Right? This is something that you know, we've learned, and, and, and what I mean we, other people who've been looking at this kind of problems, learn along the way, is the fact that you know, everything I told you about so far is for S less or equal 1. Conservation of energy is a very strong norm. It's a very good information uh, 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 on my solution. As soon as I go above, this conservation of energy, which people try to use in many different ways, become uh, an information which is actually, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's unclear how to use it. And in fact, for everything I'm going to tell you about, and this is just a very small part of the story, you can definitely consider that it's completely useless. Okay, you can, you can just from scratch forget this information. I will never ever use it because it doesn't leave uh, uh, at the scales where I'm looking at things, okay? But it doesn't mean that you can certainly build solutions which we use this, but, uh, but, but not for what I am going to uh, talk about. Okay, so if I am there and if I am staring at the question uh, uh, of the energy supercritical NLS, of course, there, there is a problem, a famous problem, that has a similar flavor. And I'd just like to spend uh, uh, 15 minutes talking about it because I think there is actually an interesting uh, 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 conceptual connection to, uh, to uh, be made here. So, of course, there is a, f a famous problem that have a, a similar f um, uh, 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 flavor, uh, which is the Navier-Stokes problem. Okay, so the Navier-Stokes problem, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a famous problem. So, it's, so, so what, what we're facing here, so it's something very simple. So I have, I have um, my fluid, u, that's the velocity of my fluid, t is time, x is space, and I am an incompressible fluid, so I need to evolve, so I have my PDE is going to be Something like this. So I have dt u plus u dot grad u plus grad p, and maybe I want to put I want to put viscosity or not. So nu is viscosity. Nu is viscosity, and uh, so p is pressure. P is pressure, and of course my fluid is incompressible. So I have divergence of u, which is okay. And this is advection. Uh, you, uh, uh, that grad u. So of course p is the nonlinearity, and you you compute p from 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 u. So if if nu is plus so nu positive, this is Navier Stokes. If nu equals zero, this is Euler. Okay, and if you play exactly the same game of uh, you know asking for scaling and conservation laws and these kind of things. So you can you can ask for the exact same thing. So if you ask for scaling, well, so if u of t and x is a solution, then you can form another one by looking at lambda squared t and lambda x, where lambda is positive. And again, this is a, this is a linear number. This is a nonlinear one. This is because of what my, my equation is. And if you look at the scale, so maybe I want to call this u lambda of t and x. And if I ask myself which sub OLF norm in L2 does not see scaling, so I want u lambda of t dot in L2, I want this to be equal to nabla s u. I'm sorry, so this is at lambda squared t dot, and this is measure in L2, then I will get my answer that s is. Uh, zero in dimension two, and it's one half in dimension three. Okay, so meaning what? Meaning that in dimension two, and of course uh, this is scaling. And if I look at the conservation law, so of course it's a conservation law for Euler, but uh, for for Navier-Stokes, it's a uh, it's just dissipation of energy. So d dt of R d u squared. So may maybe I can simply put it li like this. Uh, the L2 norm 
This is because I have a diversion free vector field is less than data. Okay, so I have, uh, so that's if you want, that's the analog of the conservation of energy. Here it's just the fact that the mass is under control. So in the language and terminology that I used, uh, you see immediately that the case SC equals zero. So in 2D, in 2D, in 2D, uh, the problem is energy critical. And you have global existence. And in fact, I had that a long time ago, proved global existence, so T is plus infinity, and essentially zero is the is the attractor, and I mean, the, you need to work a bit to show this, of course. But the, the, the heart of the proof is that the critical norm is strong. Is strong. But in 3D, of course, it's an open problem. It's an open problem. Whether or not the singularity formations can form, and you know, you can see the analogy is very clear. Scaling is half a derivative above your, your conservation law. Conservation laws are weak, so uh, you are typically in the energy supercritical range. Uh, so this is an energy supercritical problem. Energy supercritical problem. So, uh, so it's open. Okay, so you do not know whether singularities will form uh, or, or not. So, in some sense, this is, this is uh, the question is analogous. However, there is something uh, amazing, of course, that was done a long time ago by Ladijanskaya. I don't know how to write Ladijanskaya. I'm just going to do it like this, and it's 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 absolutely connected to to what people thought and tried to do also on this other problem. Lajenskaya, so it's in the 50s, what was shown, it's, it's an amazing result, was shown that um, if, you, if you look at the Navier-Stokes equation in 3D, and if you assume, if you assume uh, um, uh, cylindrical symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, no swell, then you recover global existence, and in fact, the fact that solution uh, go, uh, go, go, go to zero. So what does it mean? It means that uh, if you add structure, right, if you make a structural assumption on the data, then you recover, you know, all of a sudden you recover the control of the solution. So how can something like this work? So, you know, it's, it's a very simple thing. So maybe uh, most of you know this, but may, maybe some don't. So let, 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 let me just say uh, uh, the, the, the following thing to understand. How, how can something like this show up? And how does it relate to, to what I want to talk about this? Uh, let, let me explain this. So what, what does it mean that you have cylindrical symmetry, no swell? So this is, this is x, y, z. So cylindrical symmetry means that if this is phi, uh, uh, and this is, I mean, so may, maybe I have ER, so this is EZ, and I have here, I have e phi. So it simply means that when you write your, uh, your vector field in the cylindrical basis, you are plus U phi plus UZ. Cylindrical symmetry means that you are is a function of R and Z only, U phi is a function of R and Z only, and u z is a function of r and z only. Okay, and then you write your equation uh, uh, um, in this uh, in this frame, and what you will see, uh, there are two things you 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 need to know. There are two fundamental structural facts. The first thing is that the equation on u phi, it looks like this. It's something like this. It's dt u phi plus u that grad u phi, and you have something I never know the sign, but it's irrelevant. I have something like u phi u r divided by r is equal to zero, so here u dot grad is just u r dr plus u z dz. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that if I form the quantity, uh, which is a so-called swirl, I mean, the swirl is typically u phi. But if I normalize this thing, I have the following thing, I have that because I can incorporate this to my transport operator, this is just conjugation by r. So I have something like this, I have dt gamma plus u dot grad gamma 
is equal to zero. Okay, so this is a structural fact of cylindrical symmetry, which is that the swirl is transported by the flow. So in particular, it comes with Stone's information on this quantity, right? So you have yourself, get yourself some a priori bound here on this quantity. But then there is a second uh, 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 fundamental information, which actually is much more tricky to capture, which is when you look at vorticity. So you curl this guy and you look at uh, omega phi. Okay, so you look at the, uh, the evolution of the omega phi coordinate. So we'll typically get something like this. So you get dt omega phi plus u dot grad omega phi. And then you have something like this. You have another term like this. I think it's minus twice u r uh, divided by omega phi, something like that. And then you have something like 1 over r squared dz u phi squared, or maybe dz gamma squared, whatever. Something, something like this, okay? So what does it mean? It means that, I mean, this term is easy to absorb. It's the same trick. I just multiply by some power of r. So maybe I define psi to be r squared. Maybe it's omega phi divided by r squared. I never know, but it's irrelevant. So, you know, something like this. And schematically, I get this. I get dt psi plus u dot grad psi. So this is transport. But I have, and I have a nonlinear term here. I have minus 1 over r squared dz gamma squared, something like this. Okay. So this is information 2. OK, so you understand, you, you need to go looking for these identities, right? It's not, you know, you need to work a bit to, to make this correct. And of course, the spectacular uh, observation here is simply the fact that if initially my swirl was 0, then it's transported. So it stays like this, and then this term drops. OK, so there is a nonlinear interaction here that is not allowed. Something is not allowed to interact, but now Xi is transported. But this is bound on Xi. Xi is derivatives of omega phi. Okay, so it's like I'm having a hidden conservation law. There is something there for a specific class of data, not for all of them. There is a specific class of initial data for which I know much more. Oh, sorry, I forgot my Laplace, right? There is the, you can add the viscous term, of course. I'm doing this for Euler. You can add all the viscous term all along the way. It's just pu pushing for you. But this is what's going on here. If I start with data, so for data with symmetry and zero swirl, I have a new constraint, my flow, essentially something is locked here, right? So of course, it brings you back to some sort of 2D situation, and you need to understand why this controls your flow, etc. But this becomes, this is the key. The key is exactly this, is that uh, you should think of it this way. The Navier-Stokes is a system of equations. It's a complicated system of equations. It's very clear that even in the simplest non-trivial symmetry class, there are non-trivial interactions here, in particular, in between the swirl and, and vorticity. It is very well known that this interaction can create tons of nonlinear structures. I mean, all the stationary vortices you hear of uh, uh, on, on Euler, for example, are related, of course, to pre -spe specifically, specifically the, this term. But in this system, there is something hidden. That is, for specific data, uh, um, there is a hidden conservation law. This conservation law is super critical. So it locks your system, and you recover global existence. And everybody goes to uh, uh, everybody is attracted by by the linear flow. Okay. So this is exactly. If you want, maybe I can write this here. So I wanted to show this simply for this reason that this is exactly the way you should think of NLS. But if I go back to my defocusing NLS, this is exactly uh, 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 the way I want to think about it. So I have, I have I dt u plus Laplace u. So I have minus u u to the p minus 1 equals 0. And I want to think exactly this is a system. This is a system of two equations. Uh, simply, okay, simply because I write u as being my real uh, imaginary part, if I want, and I can think of this as, as a system for u1 and u2. And my point is the following. Can I, in some sense, formally, I mean, f this thing for Navier-Stokes is telling you that if you simplify your system, then essentially, uh, if you simplify it too much, nothing happens, right? Can I do the same thing here? Do I have some sort of formal, simpler model that would have a similar flavor and for which I could get answers? And the answer is yes, of course I do. Right? There is a completely uh, a, a trivial problem. Right, so if you want, I like to think of it as the scalar problem. We simply take the heat equation. Right? 
right? So simply, simply take dt u equal a plus u, say minus u u to the p minus 1. Okay, then what I want to say is the following. So this would be the defocusing hit. Defocusing hit. And of course, I would have the focusing problem would be dTU is Laplace U plus U, U to the P minus 1. This would be the focusing hit. OK, then if I look at the focusing problem, so and think, think of it, think of this as being put yourself in the situation where S is bigger than, than 1. OK, so in terms of conservation law, I mean, now things are not conserved, they are dissipated, but it's exactly the same thing. You have an energy that is, lives at the uh, 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 H1 level, and you can say, you know, if you look at the focusing problem, it's, it's you know, it's, you need to work, but it's very well known that indeed, in the energy supercritical case, and I will certainly go back more precisely to this space. So if I look at the at the at the heat equation uh, in the energy supercritical range, then yes. So if, and I'm sorry, and I make it focusing, focusing. Well then, oh yeah. So there are ton. Yes, there exist uh, uh, data, well localized and, and smooth and everything you want, such that T is finite. And you should think essentially that um, uh, there are many blow-up scenarios. Actually, I, I, actually, so I will go through this in detail. So there are di there are various blow-up scenarios, which I will recall you. Um, and most of these blow-up scenarios are now known also, right? And this is this is there, there is some universality here. It's also so similar. Uh, results hold for focusing LS. So, so in the focusing case, if you want your scalar model allows you to understand many things, it's simpler because it's a scalar model, and whatever you've understood here makes a lot of sense for the system as well. Singularity formation can be constructed there that in some sense are the analog of what was known for the heat equation. That's in the focusing case. But in the defocusing case, uh, so if I have the heat equation, uh, and S is bigger than 1, so you could tell me, well, but you are, uh, this is above scaling. Uh, my conservation law is very weak. So in, in principle, I am exactly in the same situation like for NLS, except that it's completely trivial if you want to see a theorem. To say it, so if I have heat, so maybe nonlinear heat, so this would be this, and LH, nonlinear heat, I am defocusing, I am defocusing, uh, epsilon is minus one, so I'm, I'm sorry, then I am, de I am de defocusing then, essentially for any reasonable data, lifetime is, is plus infinity. Okay, the defocusing nonlinear heat equation will not form singularities and the proof is completely trivial. So if you show something like this, it means that you've understood there is a hidden, there's something hidden here. There is something, you know, there is something that locks my system and which I like to think of being exactly uh, the analog of, of my of my swirl business. It's simply the fact that this is too, uh, too, uh, too uh, simple. So what's the proof? So the, the, the proof is, is the following. Just look at your, so this is x, and just draw u of t and x. Okay, and let's stick with positive solutions, say, to begin with. So think that you gave yourself a data, and look at your solution. Okay, it's something like this. It's some function space, so it needs to go to zero at infinity. And look at the point where you achieve your maximum. Okay, so this is the point, I don't know, maybe which depends on t. Okay, this is the point where u is maximum. Well, but at this point, this is negative, but this is positive, so this is minus, so this is negative, and the Laplace is negative. 
So DTU at this point is decreasing, which means that the soup of my solution is decaying in time. This is an infinity bound on the solution. End of story. I mean, so it means that you have an a priori bound, you that infinity is under control. This is a supercritical norm. You go back to your equations, you will close ev everything you want. You will never form singularities there. Okay? So the defocusing nature of the problem, the fact that you have a minus sign here, uh, uh, so of course this, this is just the, the maximal principle, tells you immediately that nothing will happen. Okay? So you should think that for defocusing NLS, uh, if you simplify in some sense, it's a system, if you simplify too much, you get the heat equation. The answer for the heat equation is completely straightforward. You will never form a singularity. Okay? So the question, and it's the same question for, it's the question for NLS, it's a question for Navier-Stokes, it's a question for, you know, write randomly a PDE, you will have exactly the same question. The question is whether or not, you know, this simplified model are too simple, or whether or not the fact that it's a system, what you're looking for, right, really, the question is, uh, uh, question is, is there a possibility, possibility for more complex interactions in, uh, in the system? Okay? And this is typically a question that's relevant, of course, for for uh, 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 fluids, and it's exactly uh, the question that we raised uh, um, for for NLS. Yes. I have a very naive question. Yes. Yes. For, for incompressible fluids, yes. it's incompressibility that's the enemy for singularity formation. What is there a geometrical interpretation of the defocusing mechanism? I don't know. You no, know, the words you said that incompressibility. I don't know. It's I don't know. Incompressible fluids is, is, is a beautiful universe. You know, take incompressible Euler. You have as many solitons as you like. You have tons of vortices. You have, you have tons of structure that, you know, for which uh, incompressibility does not lead to, to destruction of the nonlinear structure at all. So why could they not concentrate? I mean, you know. And so, so, so for, for, for defocusing analysis, it's the same thing. You know, of course, the, you, you understand, the linear problem will never form singularities, right? So the question is exactly this. Can this act for concentration, or does it act against con concentration? And of course, there is something, one of the nice things here, this is exactly as I said, something you see immediately, for example, is that permanent structure in time, solitons, they immediately disappear in the defocusing case. Okay, so this is bec be because you don't have stationary solution to this equation that live in your function space. So it's really a case where, at least on some special solution, you see that this has a very different, you know, this has a very repressive effect. It forbids, you know, guys that don't move and that will stay there forever, which is not even the case uh, uh, for incompressible oil. Now, if you talk, it's a different story, right? If you had the, if you had the, the this, this, this viscosity. Okay, so, 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 so the question is exactly this one, do I have, can we exhibit or not? You know, in some sense, you should think of it this way. Is there some sort of hidden structure in the system that again will lock uh, uh, all solution and that will lead to a global existence? Or can there be mechanism, of course, strongly induced by the nonlinear term, strong interaction mechanism that could lead uh, uh, to singularity formation? So the answer that we gave, so uh, we announced this at the beginning of 20 and it's published in 22. Uh, so this is uh, with Frank, uh, myself, uh, Igor, uh, and Jeremy. It's, so all we did is we, we, we gave examples. So let me just take one example. So we say if you take D equal five, say if P equal nine, uh, which is so you, you do your algebra, this is indeed the case when s is bigger than one. What, what we do for you is we construct, we construct a data which is, you know, which is C infinity smooth and as decaying as you want. Maybe don't ask me for compact support because it's going to be a mess, but you know, you, you can make it decay, such that the corresponding solution 
to NLS, which is a unique, strong solution. That's the one that, you know, it's not Ginebra Velo, but it's uh, the one that you get from regularity for, for obvious reasons. And the unique solution of your Cauchy problem will form a singularity. Okay, so it gives a clear answer that yes, it's possible to form singularities in the defocusing world. And I would like to say immediately, uh, I'd like to say three things. So first, it gives you an answer. So it's not because you're defocusing that you will not form singularities. Indeed, there is a possibility. The nonlinear term can have a huge impact on the solution, and, and, you, can, and, you, and, you, and you can form singularities. So there are three, three, three comments I want to make. So comment one. And this is maybe the most important thing, in some sense. Uh, what is behind this theorem is what I like to call supercritical numerology. Right? It's not about, uh, of course you need to be an actual supercritical, but this is not it. I mean, these are not, there are other numbers, there's other features. That, I mean, what, where you need to be and how you need to, to stand is, is something uh, 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 absolutely essential. It's typically this kind of numerology that drives what is happening here. And, and this supercritical numerology is not a surprise. We've been looking for this for a long time, and this is something that is well known typically when you study blow up. Uh, for blow up for the focusing heat equation. Well, and in particular, I'd like to say that you know there's been lots of you know there's been a lot of saying on the heat equation. Well, I mean when people study singularity formation for the heat equation in large dimensions and with large nonlinearities, I mean these problems are completely irrelevant in terms of physics. There is no physics there. And, but they are very much relevant in terms of phenomenon. People learn absolutely fundamental things there. And, and, and the mechanism, the phenomenon that they see there, they see it in large dimension and for large P because it's the Kitt equation. But as a matter of fact, it's this phenomenon in some sense <coughs> that come back for the NLS here and that will come back <coughs> in compressible fluid in 3D. Right? So this is really, there's really this idea that what's been there, which in some sense look very academic, and which is in some sense very academic, is absolutely fundamental and will feed our intuition to attack maybe more physical problems. So, so this is the first thing, but this, this notion of supercritical numerology, the fact that you know, there are exponents, there are, there are rule, and, and as you will see, the, 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 um, what's behind this, what the numerology is here for, numerology, of course, you know what's going to happen. It's here to ensure the existence of suitable nonlinear structures that support uh, the energy concentration. But you need a very special wave packet. Uh, uh, that can actually handle the singularity for formation. This special wave packet that corresponds to this notion of scenario that, that I told you about. Is we, what we do is we construct solution in specific scenario, and this scenario, they are relevant if you can show that some specific structure are there, and, and they are there thanks to the numerology, right? And it will play an absolutely essential role. So I hope that by the end of this class, this will be absolutely crystal clear. I want to make this you know, from A to Z. So this is the this is the the first thing uh, I want to say. Uh, the second thing I want to say is <clears throat> comment two. Is that uh, uh, um, the you know the blow up scenario that are known. That are known uh, for the focusing case uh, do not apply, do not apply directly to the defocusing one. Uh, 
right? So, uh, you know, in the beginning, it's not like, you know, you've understood something in the focusing case and it will apply because you modify something. Like that. So there is something, it really cannot. They're, they're really, it's also related to what I told you about in the energy critical case. You know, there are some nonlinear structure that you use in the focusing case. They are no longer there. Okay. So you have to deal with that. There, there's some part of what you know are, are gone. However, however, there will be a connection however and this is where we use that you know this is this is this equation and no other uh, there is a connection a connection which is actually you know it's an interesting co co connection uh, a connection uh, uh, is made with uh, uh, more, I should say, with familiar, familiar objects in, uh, uh, with familiar objects in uh, 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 the focusing well uh, through compressible fluid, and maybe. Yeah, this is perfect. And this is what I want to spend the last 30 minutes explaining. What is going on here? And what is this connection? What are we, what has been done exactly? So let, let me explain. It's a very simple thing. What do these singularities look like? So, so in this theorem, so, so uh, uh, singularities are not described, or the solution, if you want, are not, you know, I have u of t and x, but the way we describe it is through the so-called hydro hydrodynamical variable, that is, it's rho of t and x, e to the i psi of t and x. Okay, so we write our complex modulus in terms of a modulus and a phase, and we study the flow, Everything is about study of the flow for rho C. Okay, and, and let me say that, let me say from scratch, you have to be completely, this is a completely stupid and insane idea. Why would I transform a semi-linear equation into something like this, which is a quasi-linear problem, which is awful? Okay, so there are two reasons to do it. First of all, many people did that before us. It's been done forever. It's done beautiful things. I mean, there are beautiful works, for example, on Gings Borlando equations, etc., descriptions of the soliton, etc., where they do this all the time. It's it's extremely powerful. So there, you know, it's not like we invented that. Not at all. It's been done. It's uh, it's been done uh, b b four. But when it comes to singularity formation, there is something. So this is a so-called Madrum transform. And I would like to explain something. This is a computation that we will do together uh, uh, at, at, at some point. But I, I, ju I just want to uh, ex explain something. So if you look at the flow in NLS form, so you look at your NLS and you write the flow in this variable. So what you will get is something like this. So you get something that looks like compressible fluid. And what I mean by that, so what's the rule? So, uh, of course, rho, you should think, so if rho, so I'm going to write compressible fluid in a second, but if rho is density, you should think that rho is the modulus of u squared. And of course, uh, velocity, I'm sorry, but I tend to call velocity u2. So it's the velocity uh, for fluids. It's typically the gradient of the phase, right? This is the typical... This is the, the typical vocabulary. So, so There is a square root on rho. When you write u equals square root of rho e to the i psi. Above, above. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry. You can take the modulus if you want. Oh, you, oh, you, put, you put the square. So you, you do it with you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So you, you prefer to put the square here, and then I put the square root here. Yeah? This, is, this is what you want. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you see your conservation laws. Uh, yeah. bay, bay. It's, just, it's just the idea that, the, of course, the, the, in fact, I mean, density is one thing, but the, the important thing is velocity. Right? It's, it's velocity that's related to the gradient of the phase. This is how equations show. 
Okay, so let me just remind you, so what do I mean by, so what are the equations of compressible fluid? So, uh, so maybe I'm going to call this NS comp. <coughs> so, so now this to conserve. So it's something like this. So you have conservation of mass. <coughs> so you have the divergence of rho u <coughs> is equal to zero, <coughs> and then you have rho dt u plus rho u that grad u plus the gradient of pressure is equal to, so you have your Lame coefficients, mu plus mu prime uh, gradient of the divergence, something like this. And you have that, and you need to, to close the equation uh, with something, so pressure is typically uh, rho to the gamma. Okay, so this is barotropic pressure. This is barotropic equation. Okay, so this is these are sort of the the, the general equations. So of course, this is just so rho is uh, is positive. Huh? It's uh, it's density. Never allow. I never allow rho to touch zero. Right. I don't want vacuum uh, anywhere. I will always ensure that this that this that does not happen. And of course, and u is velocity. Okay. So for all instances of pop up, I mean. You know, I, I don't really care for this structure here. Just think that this is like, just think I have some viscosity times Laplace, roughly. Yeah? Just, just think that this is a dissipative term. This is what I want. And of course, if I decide that nu is zero, uh, I will call this Euler comp. Okay, so you have some, you, you have two, two couples of equation here, and one of them comes with with uh, uh, a viscous term. Okay, so the point I want to make, just schematically, all I want to say is the following thing. When you write NLS, so I invite you to do that, if you write NLS, so you, if you write IDT plus Laplace minus U, U to the P minus one equals zero, and you declare that U is maybe square root of rho, I don't know, E to the I psi, well, you will do your algebra, you will check it out, and what you will get, roughly, and again, I will do this computation in detail, so not on this equation, but on another one. What you will get is, some, is, some, is something like this. So you will get one equation, which is exactly, con, con, it's exactly the same thing. So you have to understand that this u is gradient of psi. Huh? It's not the same u. So you get something like this. And you will get a second equation, which is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the right hand side. You have something like, you have something weird. You have, maybe there is an I, it's weird. This is what uh, physicists like to call quantum pressure. So if you want to just think that, that the way your Laplace acts on your variable, so it, it's formally it looks the same, but there's really a, a very funny term here. Which, uh, which of course is not exactly this. You cannot map the equation the one onto the other, but there is, you know, you know there, is, there is part of the structure is, is, is related. Okay, so the way we study, so uh, uh, plan, plan, if you want the basic observation, the basic observation is that in a regime Uh, uh, of singularity formation. And I will detail this very pre 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 precisely. Uh, uh, one can treat quantum pressure as a perturbation. That is formally, this is exactly, if you want, this is exactly as if, as if. So treating it as a perturbation means the following thing. It means that the question that you ask, if you treat contemplation as a perturbation, it means that if you believe that you can throw it to the garbage, 
much. It means that whatever is left is really Euler. Not an approximation of Euler, really Euler. Okay, so, so if quantum pressure is thrown to the garbage, this means that the program is the following. Program is, is the following or program if you want. This is, this is the question. This is what we want to do. The question is the following. Can you find, can one find data such that Uh, 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 the corresponding, if you want, such that um, the corresponding solution to Euler, okay, so you take viscosity equals zero to Euler uh, blows up, and and dissipation. Or if this is not your Stokes, or uh, 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 quantum pressure can be treated as a perturbation. As a perturbation. Okay, so what I'm asking here is the classical zero viscosity limit, if you want. What I'm saying is the following words. I'm saying, you know, pretend that your quantum pressure, it's exactly like, you know, dissipation for my fluid problem. The question I'm asking is the following. Can I treat this term as a perturbation? That is, can I find initial data such that if I take nu equals zero, I blow up in finite time. But if I turn nu on, it still also, it will still form a singularity. It will still form a singularity. I want to treat this as a perturbation. So you understand two things here. The first thing is that you have to be very careful. This will never be a perturbation. You cannot throw your Laplace on the right. I mean, I'm not going to do uh, nash moser et cetera, right? And so, so this is the highest number of derivatives in my equation. I will have to remember at some point that it's pushing for me, and it will. But, but nevertheless, the, the question is exactly this, this one. Can I find singular bubbles for Euler such that viscosity uh, can be treated as a perturbation. And as a matter of fact, this question, uh, first of all, we, we certainly do not have a complete understanding of this question, but once you ask this, there are two things you need to say. The first thing is that, the, 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 the first thing you need to say that there exists, and actually these were the most, uh, uh, the best understood type of singularities uh, known for error, there exist uh, 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 so-called shock type singularities. For Euler, uh, so there is a, you know, there is a, uh, this is a universe, I mean, of course, it goes back in particular uh, uh, to the work of Sideris a long time ago and the work of Christo de Loup. Uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 2000. So they're just shock type of singularities for Euler, and it's a theorem. And they do not survive, they do not survive dissipation. So you see, the, the all viscosity limit is not a completely trivial problem. It's certainly not. If you blow up for this, don't, there's no reason why you should work for this. It's completely false. There are explicit examples. It's a theorem that the type of singularity that shock provide you will not survive this. It's not strong enough. Okay, and you see this very clearly in a, in a computer. I mean, in some sense, shock is ge generic behavior for, for, for gen generic singularity for Euler. This is what's expected as soon as you turn any sort of uh, uh, um, viscosity. It, 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 it eliminates them immediately. I'm sorry, I go back a little. Uh, I'm sorry if you said this, but did you explain how you relate your parameters of your uh, NS compressible uh, with the parameters of the Schrodinger equation? I mean, for example, yeah, gamma and mu. This, uh, so you, you are absolutely right. So I promise I will do this computation from A to Z, uh, probably next time. Okay. So you should think that that no, but this is let let let, let me anticipate. So gamma is p minus one. Right, it's just so uh, if I have the nonlinearity u modulus of u to the p minus one, gamma is two over p minus one, or, so, or something like this. 
Okay? The reason why I will have a viscosity, which is maybe exactly the point, why do I have a parameter new there? Why can I play with something that wants to become small? Oh, but that's because I'm not looking at the equation in original variables. I'm going to renormalize. I'm going to look at them. After renormalization, I'm going to zoom on the singularity. And it's the zoom that's going to create, in fact, a time-dependent viscosity that I will treat as a perturbation. Okay, but I want, I want to make this crystal, this will be made crystal clear. Uh, uh, um, uh, but if you want, conceptually, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to transform NLS into something that looks like Euler, but in fact, it doesn't look like Euler. It's Euler modulo viscosity, something viscous with a parameter new that actually will go to zero in time. And that's the program. Form singularity for Euler, treat viscosity as a perturbation, okay? And if you can do it for NLS, you can do it for, uh, for viscous fluid because the, the program is the same. So this is the way we presented things. It was saying if we can do it there, it's the same thing to do it actually for uh, the actual equations uh, 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 of fluid mechanics. But if you want to do this, this, this program, the first thing I want to say is that it's not, it has no reason to work in general. It's not true. It's not because you blew up here that you blew up there. It's the other way around, actually. The only examples we had tend to regularize this, the singularity for, for formation. Okay? So, so this is the, the, the first thing. The second thing I'd like to say is that, interestingly enough, for Navier Stokes, for Navier Stokes comprehensible, uh, there are, there exist, and it's, it's not trivial, actually, it's, it's beautiful work. There are virial type, as I explained, uh, uh, blow up argument. That is, there are beautiful results that tell you that uh, some classes of initial data cannot live forever. That there is an obstruction to global existence, even for the fluid problem, right? So, but this is only in dimension bigger equal than, than three. And actually, uh, the only virial type arguments that I know, they apply, this is very interesting actually, they apply to non-radial data. They typically need to use uh, in a very strong way, the conservation of uh, the evolution of kinetic momentum, it's, it plays a crucial role uh, in the proof. So in some sense, it's a problem where you know Navier-Stokes compressible in dimension bigger than three, you know that this thing can form singularities, there are virial type arguments, but if you had no, you need to be non-radial and you had no description, right? you had no, no explicit description. Okay, so 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 this was what uh, needed to be uh, uh, to be overcome. So at the end of the day, what's the uh, what is the theorem that we proved? Uh, so what is the theorem that we proved? So theorem. So this is the same thing. So with uh, Igor. Journey. So what we uh, uh, prove is, is, is the following thing, is that if you're in dimension three and you need, and you need the nonlinearity gamma uh, to be in a special, you know, in, I, I will be much more precise when, it, when I do the, the proof, but gamma needs to be in a specific range, gamma one, gamma two. Okay, so you need to take nonlinearity in a specific range then then uh, there exist uh, initial data, which are smooth and C infinity, smooth and decaying, such that uh, the singularity, uh, the solution at the end of, of, the, of, of the day, I will blow up in finite time. And in, in fact, there is a complete description uh, of the singularity and in particular uh, among the things so what will happen if you want in everything I'm going to talk about so typically if, if I look at density for example uh, you know I can look for example I know I can look at the uh, you, you know I can look at the soup norm of density and so this thing you know it's it's going to concentrate density is going to become as you expect, it's going to concentrate at the origin. So it's, if I draw a row of T and X, it's going to be something like, like this. It's going to be something that concentrates. 
And among the things that come with this theorem is something that we very much expected. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right, Frank. Let's not have density to uh, vanish. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Uh, but among the things that we learn, and this is something that we learn, of course, that is everywhere uh, uh, in the literature on the focusing problem, and, and, and to begin with on, on the heat equation, is that you cannot choose the rate at which concentration form, what I like to call the blow up speed, is something very quantized. So it's, it's typically a constant divided by t minus t to some number, which I like to call alpha k, and alpha k is not anything, is a prescribed sequence. And you have the same thing for, uh, for velocity, so what it means is that in a suitable range, so in dimension 3, in a suitable range, uh, you can show that uh, Navier-Stokes will form, uh, actually it's the radially symmetric compressible Navier-Stokes, it will form singularities, and for the singularity that we construct, the blow-up speed is something very rigid, it's, it's a universal sequence, and, and we need to understand uh, 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 where this uh, universal sequence uh, 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 comes from. If you, if you transfer this You know, so it's exactly, it's exactly these solutions, right? It's, it's exactly these solutions that are used for defocusing LS. And, and if you find, so the way you should think of it is, if you think of it this way, so uh, if you are rho e to the i psi, and in fact, what's happening is that if you want to, if you, if I draw, because of what these solutions look like, if I try to draw what my function looks like, if this is x, so of course I don't know how to draw a complex number, but roughly the, the picture is the following that, you know, density is going to be, so u amplitude is allowed to be huge. So you have something like this, but of course it will oscillate. But of course, what will happen is that psi will also explode, right? So this thing wants to oscillate like, like, like crazy, right? It wants to, if, if, if I draw it at, uh, at a given time, it's going to have a certain number of oscillation, then it's going to cool down. And you should think that what happens dynamically, that these number of oscillations, there are more and more of them as time evolves, right? So it really blows up like by oscillating more and more and more, because this by this phase is really getting crazy. Okay, so this is the way uh, uh, the singularity uh, forms. And you see immediately why, why defocusing NLS? Why the minus sign? Why IDT minus u, u to the p minus 1? This is simply because it's written there. You know, if you, if you look at... It's the sign here. When you, you know, the way things push, there's nothing I can do. Another way of seeing this, if you want. If you write down, for compressible fluid, if you write down the conservation law, that is, if you try to understand how you and the nonlinear term, which is pressure, talk to one another, you will find that the, if you want the energy up to uh, the sun, is something like rho grad u squared plus 1 over p plus 1, or maybe there's a gamma or some, some factor, rho to the gamma, something like this. It's a plus. Exactly like in the focusing problem. So the, the way the nonlinear term in the compressible Euler problem and in the defocusing NLS come to one another is exactly this sign. Okay? And the beauty is that uh, uh, dissipation has the correct sign. Because you know, quantum pressure it could be something awful. Maybe it comes with the wrong sign. I don't know. So you need to compute that and you know, it pushes for you. That's a miracle. Okay, so you need algebra. It's not like you can do whatever you want. You need algebra to actually uh, push for you. And this is exactly what's going on. Defocusing is because compressible Euler pushes for you, and viscosity, or quantum pressure, is going to push uh, uh, for us. OK, so what I will do next time is I will take maybe an hour to recall you what we know in the focusing case, and how structure that seem completely irrelevant to this problem will turn out to be totally relevant for this problem, because this is what will build our intuition. And then we will start from scratch 
working on this problem. And you know, I don't want to show all the details because we'll all get bored, but I certainly want to show you some of the key features that underlie this construction, some of the key objects, how numerology comes in, what kind of objects we need to control, and what kind of uh, linear and nonlinear analysis we need to do to actually uh, show this, that in some regimes there are singularities which in some regime, uh, in which in some regime, viscosity is lower order. That's the key. So I will start this uh, next month. Yeah. So thank you. Coming back to this supercritical focusing analysis yeah. and your blowing up solution, uh, what can you say about the critical sublet norm? Yeah, so there is a. Yeah, yeah, so there, 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 there was this paper by Tao on, on uh, uh, I think it's on the Nidus talks, yeah. and it's Bulut yeah. who transformed this uh, in, the, in the 3D case. Beautiful results. Yeah. So, so indeed, so what she showed, so what is Bullet's statement? It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So, you see, Frank and Carlo showed us in a very general framework that uh, if you form a singularity, the critical needs to blow up, right? Because otherwise, uh, you have you have regularity. And what Bullet said is that, uh, and again, this follows from I mean, this the previous work of Tao, which, which uh, and and, and it, this 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 came after. And it's a beautiful thing that if you give her data and you suppose that uh, it forms a singularity, then there is an S, or there is an epsilon, which depends on data, such that all Sobolev norms below, right? So, so if you want, if, if, if S is between S critical and S critical minus epsilon included, then critical norm blows up, will we'll explode. Still goes to T. Okay, so there are scaling breakers, right? They need, you need to, okay? So, of, thank God we do see this too, <laughs> which makes sense. Uh, but there's a point here. This is, this is, so this is exactly to, to the point. This exactly answer the question. This is, this is all about viscosity. Why do we have a lower order of vis viscosity? That's because we break scaling. And why do we, because we break scaling from the root equation to go to another equation, which will leave at scaling. But this scaling breaker, which creates indeed viscosity to be lower order, is exactly this. So you can count on the solution that we construct, you can count this number. It's in the appendix of the paper. Indeed, there is a gap. And it's exactly, it's renormalization. It's, it's because this is exactly, how, this, is, this is what I'm going to do. So it's embedded in the strategy. Thank you.